Hey, it's Mark Podolsky, the Land Geek, with your favorite niche real estate website, thelandgeek.com. And on this week's roundtable, we have almost all the usual suspects. We've got the Zen master, Mike Zeno. We've got the technician, Eric Peterson. I love it when you call me Big Papa, Tate Litchfield. And of course, you know him. You love him. Scott Todd, scotttodd.net, landmoto.com. Learn anything about anything, investorninjas.com. We've got a crazy little uh, format for our, our Ryan Table podcast today. We took questions from the last boot camp. And since we're discussing boot camp, why not have a shameless plug? The next boot camp is April 23rd to 25th virtually. Go to landgeek.com forward slash boot camp to register. And if you don't have tickets, see how you can get your tickets. Um, so we took the questions from the last boot camp. And I thought it would be fun to do a lightning round. We're going to be ambitious. We're going to try to get through five of these questions, maybe maybe even more. So the first question is a Scott Todd question. If you have not taken Scott Todd's uh, accounting for land course, do that because then you've got it, that knowledge. But we'll still we'll still extract some more accounting knowledge from Scott Todd. So the first question is, is the tax deduction something you can take advantage of in this business? Is the tax deduction something you can take advantage of in this business? The way they phrase it, I'm going to just say, are tax deductions something you can take advantage of in this business? Because I'm not sure what they mean by the tax deduction. Okay. So basically, um, anytime you have a company, uh, an LLC company, you have tax advantages favoring Let's think back to Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And in this, I think it's the second book, Cash Flow Quadrant, he shows you uh, on the left side of the quadrant, you have employees and the self-employed. And on the right side, you have business owners and investors. And the rules are different for the business owners and investors. The rules are different. So by having your own company, a, being a business owner, then ultimately what you have is you have tax advantages that are available to you. Such as like, I, I mean, everybody knows, okay, you can write off your home, but the fact that your headquarters are, are in your home, you get other tax advantages, things that, that if I had my own, if I was a dentist working in the dental office, I couldn't get. So you have a lot of advantages um, available to you when you have your own company and you work from home, you get more advantages. So are there tax advantages? Absolutely. All right. Fantastic. The second question, I'm going to direct this one to Mike Zeno. Uh, Mike, can you talk about successes for individuals working this business solo? Well, that's an interesting question uh, because, I mean, even if you have an individual working solo, um, if they follow our method, they're going to have a team. So it's sort of a, sort of a conundrum there. I don't know if that's the right word, but you know, so I work with the business with my wife, but there are people I know that work the business solo and, uh, but what they do to overcome, remember to me, I, I think of the business, like, uh, there's all these little minor tasks that have to happen. It's almost like, uh, uh, you know, playing catch with the ball. There's a bunch of people playing, playing catch with the ball. You can't drop the ball, right? And how do you not drop the ball? Well, you have people that are trained to handle each and every task of the business. So if you were to do this by yourself and you weren't to out, we're not going to outsource it. You would probably be limited in the amount of deals you could do, or you would be working a lot, right? You would just be working a lot of, spending a lot of time in the business. So there are lots of people that are working as solo individuals that are having massive success, but behind them is a team of people handling all the minutia, all the small tasks. So you can do it, but if you want to do it in high volume, you, you, you're looking to build a team and you're looking to follow the structure that we teach. And Scott teaches in flight school. Yeah, it's a trick question because really what that person is saying is they're they're not really saying it's a business, right? An individual working in this business solo is doesn't have a business. I remember meeting Ori for coffee and uh, I was telling him all the things I was doing. And uh, he's like, don't insult me. Call me, call yourself an entrepreneur. He's like, you got a job. I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, well, if you're doing all the work, then you're not building anything bigger than yourself. He's like, you know, if you die tomorrow, would you have a business? I'm like, no. He's like, if I think at that time, uh, Steve Jobs had just passed. 
He's like, look, Apple didn't go away, did they? He's like, that's actually a business. I don't, he's like, I don't, he's like, what you have just sounds like a better job than what you had before. So I went back and I started hiring people. What a great point though, huh? Wow. Yeah. I mean, it's like a hobby. You can, I always tell people, you can do one or two deals here and there. Great. No problem. You want to do lots of deals? You need to build a team. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. This one, I think we can, we can actually round table. Let's start with uh, Eric. Eric, have you ever done any purchases from a, from a foreign owner? So that would require mailing people outside of the U.S. Um, and I scrub my list or my team scrubs my list to remove those people. We don't mail to people outside of the U.S. Um, the closest example I could come up with is, uh, I believe, years ago. It's, it's been a while now. We, we bought a property um, and the owner happened to live in Puerto Rico. Um, not, not really out of the, the U S I suppose, but, um, nonetheless, um, that's as close as I could get to, to being outside of the country. All right. Tate, did you ever buy outside? You know, I follow the same approach that, uh, Eric just kind of outlined. We don't typically mail to people who live outside the U S, uh, just because it's a logistical nightmare, right? If you're trying to buy somebody, they got to go to typically a an embassy and get something notarized. So it's a lot of work. But one time Scott and I, Scott, we bought a property, right? Wait, Scott, you're on mute. Oh yeah. Oh, we did buy a property from a guy. Oh boy. What a mess. Let's hear that story. Take it away, Scott. All all I can say is never again. That's all I'm going to say. Okay. So the, the guy was in England, right? And his assist, his assistant was in um, what country? Nigeria or Kenya or something like that. Kenya. That's it. Kenya. The the assistant is in Kenya. Okay. So the the assistant was working with us. And um, basically, it's really kind of weird because they're like, well, we want you to send us the money. And we're like, you're in Kenya. No, we're not sending the money. You signed that deed first. And it was the old stalemate kind of a thing. And it's not like I could go and hire um, a notary to run down there. And then the, the, the guy, the, the seller, the actual seller, well, he's in England. And we could never get to him. It was always to this person that was in Kenya. And so everything that we were doing was we were talking to the person in Kenya, trying to get them to relay the message to the guy in England. The guy in England England finally, you know, came back and said, well, I don't want to do this because uh, I don't want to do it unless I get paid first. And we're like, we're not sending you money until uh, till we know it's done. So we compromised. What we did was we found an attorney in the, the land was in Nevada. So we found an attorney in Nevada that would basically handle the closing, but basically he he didn't even require us to do title insurance or anything. He just said, look, for $500, I'll be the go-between. And he was, but even he struggled with the person in Kenya and England and getting all this stuff right. And I mean, it was just a long drawn out mess and I, I, I'm like, I'll never, ever buy another property from someone outside of America, period. Well, and, and Scott, remember, he tried to, like, call our bluff, too. He was like, look, oh, yeah. if you don't give me the money, then I'll sell it to someone else. And it was a lot of money, right? It was, it was like $30,000. It was $30,000. Yeah, yeah, and we were going to sell it for, like, sixty or sixty-five. So we wanted the deal, but he was like, I'll sell it to someone else. And we're like... Okay, go ahead. Go, go and, for it, bro. It's not happening. And he came back to us, I don't know, a week or two later, and he wanted us to get on a Zoom call with him at like 2 in the morning, and we're like, yes. no, no, we're not doing that. And, and remember, everything was not communicated to this guy. This is a mystery guy. Everything was communicated through the person in Kenya. And I'm like – do I need to send a glitter bomb to their house? Or like, I don't know. Like this can't be legit. That was a weird one. 
But yeah. so yes, yes, we have bought from international buyers in the past and uh, we didn't mail it to this guy for the record. He came to us and said, hey, look, I've got this property. Do you want it? And I now realize why all the other investors who he had talked to prior to us had passed on the deal. Makes perfect sense now, but uh, we were committed. We ended up getting the deal done, but I mean, we probably could have closed 10 deals in the amount of time that we spent with him. Yeah, I mean, it's just, I mean, as Tate said, the person has to go to the to an embassy. And I mean, because they don't normally have notaries in these foreign countries. And you're talking about a time zone change. And you're talking about a, a standoff between who's going to do this. There's no real easy way of doing this. I guess the easiest way to do that transaction would be to definitely take it to a title company. And the problem with that is that, you know, a title company is going to add a lot of money to the transaction. It's going to cost another thousand dollars to do that. So it's just, you know, you, you got to figure out how you want to do it. And like Tate said, in the amount of time, I mean, Tate was dealing with the guy I was dealing. Well, we, we were dealing with the situation. We were both dealing with it and it, it was frustrating and it was time consuming and in the meantime, we probably passed other deals. But like Tate said, this was a bigger deal. And we're like, we want this deal. So, well, I remember at one point I called you and said, I'm, I'm out, Scott. I'm out. I'm out. You do it. And I was like, I'm done. I don't care anymore. And you're like, come on, Tate. I'm like, no, no, <laughs> I am out. <laughs> it was terrible. And then, then to make matters worse. Okay, now, now we're going to compound it. And now we're going to, okay, so we just told you this was a, I think it was like 360 acres. Wasn't that right, Tate? It was like 300 and, it was a large property, 360 acres. It was big. 30, I don't remember. $30,000. And it took us a very long time to sell that big property. It really did. I mean, everybody wants to talk about these big deals. You know, oh, well, I'm going to go after the higher dollar amount stuff. I don't, I mean, I know people out there that do it. I mean, Mark, you and I were on a podcast with somebody else and they said that they were, they were making like a six figure profit on one property because it was a higher end property. Right. Maybe it's a quick flip or something, but I got to tell you something, these higher end properties, they, they don't, they don't work well with owner financing. The yield is terrible on them. I, I mean, I did a deal where I think I paid seventy-five thousand for the property and sold it for one hundred and fifty thousand with owner financing. My annual yield on that thing is like twenty-two uh, percent. I could literally take my money and give it to a syndicator and go run an apartment building for that amount. I, I, like uh, you lose the account, you lose the benefits that you that you normally get with these faster, you know, moving properties. And I had to sell that property, I think, for over a year to sell that thing, and. I, I don't even remember how long we sat on this other one, Tate. It, like that, a, it was it was a long time. The time value of money was, you know, we, yeah. we lost we lost a lot of momentum with that capital. This is another good roundtable uh, podcast, just about yield, and you know, big deals versus small deals and velocity of money. We can get really geeky with it. Scott, you can get the financial calculator out. We can have a ball with this uh, this topic. I, listen, I just did a whole one hour live segment last week on this exact topic and you know if you go to my website scotttodd.net it's it's there uh watch the replay it's called financial education how to how to use tvm to build wealth and i gotta tell you something like it you can get into the weeds on, on this stuff uh but you know just just keep buying the land that we talk about and you'll be golden all right, well, let, let's get back on track um, and apologize to the people in the UK. No, no, it wasn't the guy really? in the UK. It wasn't well, the UK. Oh. He was a mystery guy. He, I, I, I can imagine he, he's drinking a pie. He's like, oh, his two blokes are going to annoy. Let's see if they'll buy my land for 320 acres. <laughs> Here you know, go. He was great. He was great. He was great. It, was just, oh. it was just, there was so much complexity. And then not to mention like Scott had his VA in it and I had my team in it. And it was like, it was just too many plates were moving at the same time. And we all wanted to get the deal done, but none of us were like going to bend over backwards a hundred percent to accommodate the other person. So we got into a stalemate. It all worked out. Everybody got paid in the end. 
it was a, it was a good, it was a good thing that happened, but it took a lot of work. That would have been a good revenge deal for Eric Peterson. Hey, Eric, we got a good deal for you. We just don't have time, but this would be, you'd love this deal. The numbers are great. Right. And I don't remember, all I remember is that whenever we had to, whenever we referred to this guy, it was always uh, Mr. Whatever his name was. So like, I, I don't even know if we ever got his real name or not. I never spoke to him. Mr. So everybody Mr. called him Mr. Land. Whatever. He's been, he must have been very, very important. I don't know. All right, let's move on. This is a Mike Zano question. Did you have any mindset blocks that you needed to overcome? If so, what were they and how did you get past them? Whoa. Okay. Um, by the way, I was thinking of the Princess Bride in the last one. Never go against a Sicilian with death on the line. Never you know, buy property when there's an Englishman on the line. I don't know. Maybe that's we could kind of morph that a little bit. Sorry for the UK. Uh, so my, my mindset, yes. Uh, oh, a ton of a mark because, you know, I, I didn't come to this business uh, with a business background, firefighter, right? So um, I think there's a lot of inherent mind blocks from there. It's like, uh, just how am I going to structure this? How am I? A lot of just what ifs. And I think that's where the power of mentorship and coaching and uh, community and, and being around uh, people that uh, know what they're doing pays its dividends, right? You know, um, you know, I heard about this business model, but uh, I didn't know how to really dial into it. So that's why I came out and met you in Arizona. That's why I got involved with Land Geek because I wanted to know. So yeah, lots of mindset blocks. Basically, for me, it was just like, how am I going to create a business from nothing? That was the biggest mindset block from the beginning. Like how am I? Like like I said, I, I know I could do a uh, property here or there, but then how do I create scale? How do I um, begin to finance this business right in the beginning? I mean, now it gets to a certain point where that becomes, you know, a lot easier. But I think there's a lot of mindset blocks, Mark. But I would say the biggest way to overcome the mindset blocks is to be around people that have already overcome them and to sort of hang around with them and, and uh, just let that rub off on you. Seriously. That's why I, I love this community. That's why I love this uh, podcast. That's why I love you guys. I come here and I just, I just bathe in all this wisdom and I just execute upon it. And that's how you overcome your mindset blocks. Yeah, I, I have nothing else to add. Um, but it, it's, I, well, I shouldn't say that. The only thing I would add is that there's, there's a reason that during boot camp, Grill the Geeks is so popular, because. You know, listening to us talk about our deals, we're almost unrelatable. But when you're talking to somebody and hearing their story, and they started maybe three months before you, six months, 12 months, even two years before you, and you hear how they evolved and what they were able to do with it, it becomes so much more real. And all those, you know, mindset blocks that you have in your head immediately disappear because you know, and as Scott Todd likes to say, if these clowns can do it, I can do it. I was that clown. I was Bozo, and he's right. So, you know, Mark, there's a book I'm reading now. I don't know. Have you ever heard of the uh, – someone on one of our – I think it was on Grill the Geek. Someone mentioned uh, – I forget who it was, The Traveler's Gift. And then there's is he, um, There's another one called The Noticer. Is this guy Andy? Andy uh, – I forget his last name. But anyway, one of his quotes is like people say don't – sweat the small stuff and and you know although in certain times in life that is important but he's saying pay attention to the little things because that's how you create the big success and i think how you overcome these these, these mental blocks is like just dialing into the the small details and handling them one at a time documenting them and yeah so pay attention to the little details and uh, go through that but anyway that's a great book i don't remember i can't remember his name but uh great book okay fantastic sweat the small stuff pay attention to it Oh yeah, don't don't oh don't sweat the small stuff because there's another book. Don't sweat the small stuff. I know he, he, he flipped he's it. Kind of capping on that. He's saying, he's yeah, the, 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 up your toe. You know what I mean? Like the 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 you know the trash man didn't take your trash. Say, I don't sweat the small stuff. But when it comes to your business, the little things do end up adding uh, do add up to big success. So I guess it's a kind of a another way to look at things. All right, I feel I, I feel like we're getting through these questions pretty quick. Let's go to Eric Peterson. Um, Eric, how? Are you funding? How did you fund your business in the beginning? Um, started off with my own capital, um, and then kind of just rolled that over and over. 
uh, to continue to fund deals. Uh, at some point, you'll, you're very likely, if you're limited on capital, to get to a point where you need more capital for the business because you know it works, you understand how to buy land, and you understand how to sell it. And um, basically, you're always going to be looking for capital sources. So um, I have used many of the options we talk about. Um, obviously, you can you can get a loan from a, a bank, a relative, a friend, um, a hard money person, uh, any of those options. Uh, you can sell notes. You can partner with people on deals. Um, I think I've used all those techniques and all of them are valid. And yeah, I think that answers it. Yeah, you know, you know, it's crazy. You know, I think a few weeks ago I was talking about reasonable versus rational. The r most rational thing you can do from a financial perspective is sell a note because the numbers are ridiculous. You know, you get your money out, then you get another bite of the apple, the, the passive comes back to you and your, your ROI is just massive on doing that. But the reasonable thing, what most people think is reasonable, like they don't want to give up any of that cash flow, and so they look at other ways. So it's 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 a very psycholog it's psychologically interesting how people will just avoid the most rational thing to do, um, which is sell a note and look at all these other other avenues of of uh, of, of of having funding. Um, but let's move on. Yeah. Let's move on. That was that was that's a good one. Um, I don't know if Tate, how do you answer this question? How do you choose the price range you go for? Very simply, how much money do you have? <laughs> that's it. I mean, seriously, that, that's, that's one of the ways to answer this question is if you come into this business and you say, hey, I've got $5,000 that I want to put towards raw land, right? Then logic tells you don't go out and mail offers to properties at 2500 it doesn't matter what you're going to sell that property for because you've you now have the option to buy two properties okay and if you can only buy two properties then you've got no options as far as snowballing your money the goal is to control as much land as you possibly can i would much rather take five thousand dollars and go out and buy you know a handful of lots in the 500 to 750 dollar price range sell those on terms quickly recover my investment and then graduate into more expensive properties so if you don't have a ton of money that's okay i didn't either but i didn't go after more expensive properties to begin with and i wouldn't you know there was a couple of reasons why i didn't do that the first was being the lack of cash i did i knew i could tap into other money but i first needed proof of concept i needed to cut my teeth so it made a lot of sense for me to go after uh, entry level properties to where if I made a learning mistake, I didn't have to quit the business. Not, I mean, flight school didn't exist back then, right? So it's not like I had somebody to say, hey, here's what the red flags are. I had to do this on my own and lean on my mentors who, you know, were very, very helpful. But at some point I was just a kid who was nagging them. So look at how much money you have, how much you're willing to spend. And then do some math. It's it's not difficult. Yeah, any like price point buys, any price point sells. Th that should be a a a, a t shirt. Man. That could be a, a Mike Zano poster there. Any Ooh, price Mike. point. I want to be quoted on your wall, Mike. Yeah, Mike. What's it going to take? Yeah, I mean, I keep dropping these knowledge bombs, and it's like, yeah, look at my horse that my two year old niece drew. You know, yeah. Um, Mike, what do you, what do you think of that? Cause you started with 40,000, 40,000 in debt. Yeah. Um, uh, were you talking about pricing the properties and the 40,000 in debt? Yeah. Like how, how do you choose the price range you're going to go for? You're going to go for these inexpensive properties. You're going to go for the, you know, the low yield, high dollar amount properties. What are you going to, what are you going to start with? Right. Well, I started, uh, as everybody knows, wholesaling. So I bought properties for three or $400 and doubled or nearly doubled my money. So I didn't have a ton of money to work with. So, but you know, back then there, there wasn't land arb. Um, there wasn't, there's a lot of creative options that exist now that, um, 
didn't exist then. As our community has grown and as it's become more creative, there's just a lot more opportunities. Even now, um, I say that if you if you control the deal, then uh, you can get funding. So I would mail everything in the beginning up to a certain point. You know, we don't buy anything over a couple thousand dollars anyway. And you can find funding all day long. And uh, or you could buy land arb. I know uh, Scott Todd was talking about that last night on a call we had about flight school. There's a website now you can go to and get land arb. I mean, uh, th there's a lot of creative things you can do now, even if you have like basically zero money. Because what's it cost, Scott, for a land arb? Like $150 or something? $100? I mean, it's ridiculous, right? I mean, you can do it 100 bucks. You know, it just, just depends on the property. And you're right. I mean, you can go to landarb.net. That's A R B, landarb.net. And, you know, there's properties up there um, when they're available. And the thing is, is that what I teach in flight school is that when you're choosing a county, you want to choose a county where you're going to have a shot of doing what Tate said. You want to buy a handful of properties. I say five to seven properties. Now, that doesn't mean if you have a quarter million dollars, you should divide and go, well, man, I can go big because at some point the market begins to, to work again and we have to stay in that that inefficient marketplace. Otherwise, what happens is your time value of money, we talked about it on this podcast today, it goes, goes away. So the best thing to do is to find that sweet spot and stay within there and buy as many of those properties as you can. And just keep just keep plowing down into what what works there. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think that you could easily hit some good numbers if you're if you're approaching it from a from a from the right starting point, which is how you got to buy five to seven to give yourself a fighting chance. Right. I'll tell you a crazy story. So yesterday um, I'm watching Scott Todd live stream. And he's he's going through, and this is for like the platinum members on Land Moto. So he's he's literally highlighting these properties. So he's like, "Oh, this must be a mistake." It says zero down, one hundred dollars a month. It's Jeff Jones's property. Jeff is listening live stream, and he puts into the chat, "No, Scott, that's right. Zero down, hundred dollars a month. You can control this property." My immediate thought was. That's a land our property. I'll put zero down. I'll flip it for a hundred down and I'll sell it for 200 a month and I'll make myself hundred dollars a month cash flow. My ROI is inf infinite. Yeah. That was just like a no brainer. I mean, Mark, uh, a couple of years ago, you and I were at elite weekend in Newport beach. It must've been about three, four years ago now. And I'm sitting there, we are sitting down for lunch and I glanced over at Facebook in the marketplace or in a buy sell group. And there's a guy and he's selling a 40 acre, 40 acre parcel in uh, Pershing, Nevada for $10,000. And his ad said um, 150 down and 150 a month or something, something to that effect. And I was, I was like, whoa. I sell these things all day long for a thousand down. Maybe it was five. It must've been 500 down. And I'm like, I sell these things all day long for a thousand down. And I also sell them for 297 a month for 72 months. And his was 36 months. So I, I email him and I'm like, I'll take the property. Now I'm paying $10,000 for a property that I would normally spend 4,000 or less on 3,000. And I'm like, this is insane that I'm spending this amount of money. But when you think about what you just said, yes, I spent two and a half, uh, almost three times more, three times more what I would normally spend on the property. But I did sell that property for $1,000 down and I did sell it for two ninety seven dollars a month. So the first year, I think I only made 150 bucks, something, something to that effect uh, per month. But it was found money. It was free money that I just picked up because I knew the value of something. So, I mean, I think that when you start to know the value of things, you start to pick them up and put them in your pocket. Well, I will take that for this amount because I'll do this with it. And that's how money is made. Absolutely. Well, Scott, I'm going to go back to you for this question. Do you teach in flight school? Starting with multiple counties to mail and then pivot down to the one where you have the most success. 
So if I go to LG Pass, I can do the drip function at, again, 60 cents for first class mail. 65. 65 cents for first class mail. It's still unbelievable. No monthly fee. And I could do 10 different counties, test them all, and see and have it automated. Okay. Well, I, I don't, uh, I, I, look, it's not a bad idea. I, as I'm thinking about the question, it's probably, it's probably a pretty good idea. But at the same time, I'm not a fan of it. And the reason I'm not a fan of it is because every time you work in a new county or choose a new county, it is really a lot of work. You got to figure out one. There's that bottle again, man. Oh, <laughs> sorry. sorry. I was going to haze you after this, but yeah. Oh. The bottle. I, the I, bottle. I, ears. Jeez. Yeah. So the. Um, can we can we edit that out, Winston? Uh, so so the yeah he'll just put a beep over it like yeah. you know, like you like I said something wrong. But what I was going to say is. The, you go get a list. Well, then you got to, you got to reverse engineer the county to figure out how to get a list. And then you got to go and you got to mail these things. And then when you mail and you start to buy in this area, the other problem that exists is, and a lot of people don't think about this, but even Mark, even Kevin Sue, uh, I read over the weekend or a couple of days ago, he wrote this thing in Facebook about lessons learned from coaching. One of the things he even said is, specialize in a county and why because every time you have to start marking a property in a county it is building a whole new buyers list it doesn't translate like oh well all of these people are buyer land buyers yes the people that you get will be land buyers for that specific county and beyond that sometimes it's even for specific areas in the county think about this for a minute if you were going to go buy a house, for example, and the realtor says, hey, I got this house for you and it's in this portion, you know, Mark, for example, is in uh, Scottsdale. So Mark, here's a house in Scottsdale. You might be like, oh, well, yeah, I'm interested. Send me more of these. Well, then Mark, what's the uh, Sun City? Okay, Sun City's on right. the complete opposite side of where Mark is. So yeah, he's in the same county. But then if the realtor starts sending him stuff for Sun City, Mark's going to be like, unsubscribe, okay? because he went down the path thinking that I want something in Scottsdale versus Sun City. So it doesn't, it doesn't translate well even within the same county. But when you now change counties, it's even more complex because now if you start sending people who want land in Scottsdale, you start sending them land in uh, Navajo County. Arizona, it doesn't work at all because everybody's going to unsubscribe or just delete it and not even click on it because you're adding no value to their lives. Makes sense. Makes sense. Well, here's the last question for our lightning round podcast. We got through 10 questions. This is an Eric Peterson question. Do you repeat mailing your seller offers or only use texts and emails to follow up? We remail our sellers you remail okay right. that was easy great podcast <laughs> um tate do you do anything differently no 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 okay um i think well, they mean mike different mark what's that i think they i i kind of interpret as if they got an accepted offer and they lose touch with them that's how i've interpreted that would you Kind of oh, sense. okay. Well, that's that isn't that is an interesting um, interpretation. So, so Eric, you're you already have talked to the seller. How would you follow up if they're not signing over the deed? In all methods possible. Um, once we get that far down the path of having an accepted offer, and we've done some due diligence, and we've been communicating with this person, when they go silent. Um, we're going to be calling them. We're going to be emailing them, texting them, mailing them documents. I mean, we're going to try everything we have available to uh, to try and get that deal closed because it does happen sometimes. You know, people just all of a sudden they disappear and you don't know what happened. Um, but right. we make every effort possible. Here, here's OK. So we're at that point now for the tip of the week, which I'm going to do. I've got two tips, but it leads me to this one. So before I give you the tip of the week, I just have to give out 
some love to our sponsor, which is Flight School. Learn how the next 16 weeks can literally transform your life. Start building that passive income quickly, safely, efficiently, without any headaches. With Scott Todd, who's done it thousands of times, leading you up that mountain, being your Sherpa, the tuition's not going to cost you anything. We guarantee it. You're going to make back that money 180 days or less in cash or no deals. Just show us your work. Just show us you're following the recipe. Learn more. Go to thelandgeek.com forward slash training. Schedule a free consultation call. Thelandgeek.com forward slash training. All right, so Eric, here's my first tip of the week. So back in the day, I had a seller that literally would not respond back to me. Now, remember, this is old old days. Like, not everybody was – texting was not a thing. Barely email. It was all, it was all on the phone. Wait, so dude. I'd say, hi, it's Mark Podolsky with Frontier Properties. Um, I have something, you know, 480, blah, 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 blah. Here's my number. I have something really important I need to share with you. Click. And they think, or like, you know, it's like, like I got cut off. And they're curious, what? And they call back. That's my first tip. So do a run-on sentence um, and let them know. This is really important. I can't wait to share this with you. So da, 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 click. <laughs> That's the first tip. The second tip is um, I imagine a lot of you right now um, who have jobs have to be on corporate meetings, right? And it's not the best use of your time. Why not send your bot for you? Take notes. Record the meeting. It gets all transcribed. So go to perfectrecall.app. Perfectrecall.app. You can try it for free. You can have your, your bot join the meeting. It connects to your Google Calendar. It'll just automatically join. It'll take notes. And I assume your boss will be happy that you're there um, with your bot instead of you personally. Like You're like, hey, I'm, I'm so busy working on this project. Uh, but I've, I'm going to have my bot come to the meeting, and I will review it later. What do you think, Scott Todd? Would that have worked at your I, Fortune 50 company or 300 company? I think it would have. It would have worked to help you get to the unemployment line very quickly. This is how out of touch I am with corporate America. Yeah. you can't send a bot for yourself. We have a VA no, no. To sit down. I'm here no. for Scott Todd. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, now, maybe if you could have had it said, like, yeah, Scott Todd's here. If it could speak with my recorded voice, that might work up until the point that they ask a question. Um, I don't I don't think that's going to fly too well, man. Really don't. What, what if it's you don't have to engage? You're just supposed to be on the meeting in the meeting. It's a big meeting. Uh, may, maybe, maybe that might work, but it would raise some eyebrows. Um, you, you know, I mean, ba based on what I'm seeing here, Mark, because it just says Mark's perfect, uh, recall, right. You know, basically if, if I could have it send a zoom, maybe my picture, um, and, or get rid of that perfect recall thing, maybe that would work. But the minute you do that. I don't know. You're probably going to be hearing from information security, and you, there's going to be a whole. Kids don't hear this. I hope like, kids aren't listening to this. That go to school, they're going to be like, "Mike Podolsky taught me this thing." They're going to have a GIF shows their face oh, making faces. It's going to be a bot, and they're not even going to be in class anymore. I learned this on the land geek. Well, it's just an efficient what? use of their time. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. They'll get to it when they get to it. I'm not saying skip class. I'm saying if it's a beautiful day out like today. Have your bot take notes for you, and then later at night, go over the information. Yeah, Mark, don't so you Mark, do this? If, if your don't, kids do this, are you just down with it? If we're playing pickleball and it's a beautiful day, or on a hike, maybe we're swimming. Absolutely, as long as they get to the work at some point, it's a win-win for me and them. We're enjoying the day. Mark, I, I remember I think a couple it, like, years ago. If you, yeah, you were telling me that you have a VA that goes in and reads important articles for you and then summarizes them. Do you still do that? They were they were like listening to books. Yeah. So he yeah, is I have them go to webinars for me. Yeah. That's yeah, hundred percent. Cool. Yeah. 
but that like that's really ambitiously lazy. This is actually the whole everything transcribed, the video. So you can really get through it. But you don't miss so wait, a thing. This thing this thing will just automate. So what you're saying is I put this I, I have a meeting on my calendar. Correct. It'll join for you it automatically. For me automatically. It will record it. Record it, the video, and transcribe it at the same time. Correct. Okay. And um, then, so it will, so I could go back and watch the, the video. And you can go back and watch the video. And you can, I think you can search for the audio. Um, you can make notes in the audio too, if there's a per certain point where, like, let's say you were actually um, in live on that call. You could actually, um, while it's transcribing, you could go in and say, "Oh, that was an important point that that per that speaker made," and then go back to it. So it actually is like a, a note taker too, or like or like what Tate said, like I wouldn't do it, but I'd have my VA do it. Say, "Oh, that's an important thing," and they could highlight it. So wait a minute. So how much is this thing? Right now, it's it's free for like the first thirty meetings or something. And then it's like 15 bucks a month. It's it's inexpensive. Okay. So look, here's the here's the deal. If you're listening to this podcast or yeah, podcast, and I see perfect recall in my flight school, I'm bumping them. <laughs> <laughs> Don't listen to Uncle Mark show up to flight school. I, I'm I, right now it's recording and I'm gonna I can type or react to that. And it, it says scroll to current word. Or I can just remove the bot if I want. Um, it's really cool. I don't know. I you'll have the voice of Siri asking you questions in flight school. I, Scott Todd, what Scott, about yeah. failing? <laughs> <laughs> oh, th th this thing doesn't work right though. I'll tell you why. Because I just tried to sign up and it won't let me sign up because my calendar is on my personal email and. It's only allowing me to work in my G Suite. Yeah, you just, you just like, I have the same problem. I just invited myself to that calendar. There's a way around it because I use Fantastical, but I also I do have a Google Calendar. And so I just invited that Google Calendar that does it. I don't know. They, they walk you through it. I just did like a quick demo. Hmm. It's less money than Otter. Dot AI and does the video, not just the audio. How's the video recording quality? Great. Great. I don't see how but, this is. Look, uh, but this to is Eric's point, like if you're coming to boot camp and we see a bunch of bots in there, we're going to really be upset. You better show up. For the, you're personally in a boot camp. There is something like if it's a really important meeting, you should show up. Right. I think you started something here. This is terrible. No, I'm saying for unimportant meetings. So as yeah. long as it's not you, it's okay. That's what I'm gathering oh. here. Oh. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, who defines important? Apparently, you got to be the land geek. Yeah, this is a philosophical question. We don't have time to go into. Um, I want to thank the listeners and remind them that the only way we're going to be able to have these interesting topics is if you do us three little favors, follow us on the podcast um, so, uh, and then rate and review. So follow, rate, review, send us a screenshot of that review, support at thelandgeek.com. We're going to send you for free the $97 wholesaling course, how to double your money 30 days or less. Um, Tate, are we good? Yeah, great podcast. Thank you. All right. Eric, we're good? We're good as, as long as we cut out the part about the last tip. So we'll cut out the part of the last tip and we'll get rid of my drink. Mike, are we good? Yes, we'll do it. Yeah, that was great. Scott? We're good, Mark. All right, let's do this. One, two, three. Let's Let freedom, freedom ring. ring. <laughs> Not bad. We usually don't ever edit the podcast, but this one might be an exception. I'm having some uh, some 
uh, audio work done on Fiverr, Mark, and I think I'm going to have them just um, record my Let Freedom Ring. So all I got to do is push a button and... Oh, you and those buttons. You and those yeah. buttons. Me and my buttons. You think, I, you think I'm ambitiously lazy. You can't even be bothered to say three words. It's for emergency use. If he loses his voice, yeah. it can still be said. Yeah. All right. Well, I know Tate's got that that lean and hungry look that he hasn't had lunch yet. Yeah. You can always you can always tell when Tate's blood sugar is dropping. It's been like a whole two hours. Intermittent yeah. fast is about to end, so I gotta go. Gotta go eat. You're intermittent fasting. You you jumped yeah, on just, that. She just. <laughs> yeah, I just did a two hour fast, man. Oh, a two hour fast. I'm actually baby, breaking my baby fast steps. In, baby in steps. Three minutes, Mark. Yeah, Mark, hey, I'm telling you, man. Every day I go uh, about uh, uh, ten hours. I'm up to ten hours now. Wow. Uh, one day I'll get to your level, Scott. I mean, one I go day. from nine p.m. to seven a.m. Yeah, and Scott Todd, you do have a good tip about uh, the free donut for a year. Oh, yes. Listen, if if you go get the COVID vaccine, not the virus, but the vaccine, go get the vaccine. And then when you're vaccinated, I don't know what they got, you, you get your little vaccination card. You take that vaccination card to Krispy Kreme. They will give you a free glazed donut every day of the year for the rest of the year, 2021. So, man, how do you get Americans to do things? Stickers and free donuts. Stickers American- and free donuts. It's the American way. Yeah. Don't they already give out free donuts? If they're making them when you come in, they'll give you a, a hot one? I don't know. Maybe. They do. I, I think so. But now you can get two, maybe. Yeah. Ah, just show your card. You're, you're golden, man. I like uh, that sugar crash is so so brutal with that glazed Krispy Kreme donut. It's not yeah. even worth it. I get a sugar a donut crash. so long, and I'm dreaming about donuts lately. I'm going to have to break down and eat one soon. Yeah. Nice. I am waiting for Krispy Kreme. I don't know, a little little logoed sweater or something. Come on, Krispy Kreme. I'll get Get you one of their hats, Scott. I know somebody. You know somebody? Yeah, like the paper ones. I'll get you one of those. (laughs) It's going to be a very special day when Krispy Kreme sponsors this podcast. Yeah. Yeah. They're going to sponsor us to see who can eat the most donuts in the entire podcast. Yeah. And they're going to be like, Mark, you can't bring up type 2 diabetes anymore. <laughs> can't win. Scott has 365 a year. <laughs> you can't win. Yeah. He's healthy. Looks great. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Can you imagine a pile of 365 donuts. I mean, I'm even trying to figure out how I can hack this thing, man. But now when you start to hack it, you go down a slippery slope. And what I mean is, um, so the donut I get is two, 250 calories. But the glazed donut is 160 calories. So I'm trying to figure out if I just... If I got two glazed donuts and cut one of them in half, I'm at 80 on top of the 160. I'm at 240. So I can actually squeeze a little bit more extra by going just to the glazed donut. But then the problem is, is if I like just, I don't know, go crazy and eat the second, the whole second one. Now I'm on a slippery slope. It's bad. So I think I just got to stick to what, what I'm doing right now. Just, just keep going. Eric, what are your thoughts on this? I I don't know. I mean, I uh, I just avoid the whole like dieting, calorie counting, all that kind of stuff. I just stay away from it. Yeah, not bad. Good idea. Yeah, there's there's a there's a great book for you to read, Scott Todd, by Michael Pollan. Called it's, I think it's called Real Food or Food or he just is like. Eat real food. I never heard of the guy, so he's not. Relevant. If it has five ingredients or more, he's like, don't eat it on the label. Maybe. I've never heard of the guy, so. You the know. Omnivore's Dilemma. You never heard of this guy? He's got like best selling books. 
No. All right. I'll, I'll send you one. I don't need it. I don't even know who he is. He's just some guy. I, I'm good. I'm good. I'm really good. All right. All right. It's true. I, I mean, you know, I think he devoted his life to all this science, but it's okay. He's just some guy. Never mind. Yeah. Okay. It's all good. It's all good. To, to each their own. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks, everybody. See you yeah. guys. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Art of Passive Income podcast. Start your journey at www.thelandgeek.com and www.scotttodd.net. Rate and review the podcast and email support at thelandgeek.com. Your screenshot for a free passive income launch kit.